It's a passage where we see uh, uh, captives being taken away by enemies and, uh, the, uh, and, and David himself going and rescuing the captive. Uh, we could surely draw some parallels to what our Savior would do as the son of David coming and rescuing we who were taken captive and bringing us and, and setting us uh, in a place and setting us on the rock and giving us life. We're, we're so thankful for our rescuer. We also, in this passage, are given a, a precedent in Israel and a teaching that those who stay by the stuff uh, are going to receive the same reward as those that go out to battle, that the support ministry is just as essential as the ministry itself. And in the judgment day, as we stand before the son of David, he will likewise uh, keep this in mind. Right now, there are people doing important works, as important as what I'm doing behind this pulpit, uh, right now in the children's ministry and in the nursery, and they will receive their reward uh, for their labor of love that they carry out when it's done for the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are, are a number of things in this chapter that we could look at and be taught from. But I want to look at a different rescue in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And that's the rescue that the Lord carried out in rescuing David himself. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. We get ourselves in places that, that we never should have been and, and we can't get ourselves out of it. But the Lord intervenes and pulls us out. I remember as a, as a father for the first time in my life uh, and uh, firstborn and, and uh, one of the first trips to the beach that we had with our firstborn. We lived in Pensacola and we got out there and, and you know, when he was real small, he couldn't walk. And so you just kind of dangle his feet in the water and see his reaction and watch him, you know, hold his feet up as the waves are coming in and have fun. But once he gets to the place where he's a toddler and he, you know, has a mind of his own and, and every firstborn does, uh, they want to get down there. They want to experience it for themselves. And so I remember having Andrew there at the beach and and uh, we got him out at the beach and he sees the water and he is ready to just go for it. And so I don't remember exactly what transpired, but he kind of got free and he just took off for the water at the beach and he's running in. Now, now you and I, if I were to run straight out into the water, would ultimately fall on my face. And I've been walking and running for 46 or thereabout years. Um, Andrew was brand new to the job of walking and running. And so when he got close to the water and he's just getting in, naturally, he fell on his face. He had started out on his own. He left behind the safe confines of his father's arms. And there he is face down in the water. To compound the problem, he hadn't yet learned in life what to do when you fall face down in water. And so he just laid there face down in the water. And if I had not been there to pull him out of the water, he would have drowned in six inches of water uh, because he didn't know any better. He didn't know how to get out. He had never had that experience before. And so there he lay until I saved his life. Andrew, if you're listening, you can thank me later. Um, but that was so much an illustration of, 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 of us. How many times in life have we thought in our mind, hey, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go out and I'm going to experience this. And on our own, we, we strike out and, and we think that, hey, we've got it made and we're going to enjoy this. And we get out on our own and we fall flat on our face. And if the Lord didn't intervene, guess what? We'd still be flat on our face. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. It's only by God's grace. Here in this passage, we're going to see David has gone away from God's will. It's been a year and a half outside of where he should have been. And he would have continued. But God intervenes and rescues David. And I want to speak to you today about the rescue and how the Lord intervened, what it meant for David, how David got back on his feet and got back into the land of promise where God would have him to be. Let's pause for prayer as we consider this morning the rescue in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Father, I come to you today. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to gather and to hold your word in our hands. Lord, may we count it as your word. Father, may we learn from the life of David from this example today. Uh, Lord, how he got into the mess that he was in. 
But Lord, may we see uh, what a waste it was for a year and a half of his life. Uh, Lord, may we be challenged by it to uh, always put ourselves under the microscope, Lord, to, to consider where we're at. Uh, Lord, if, if the things that we're doing matter, if the things we're, we're doing are going to burn up one day, uh, Lord, I, I pray that you would bring us to a place where we're revived and living for you and back in the will of God if we're outside of it this morning. Lord, you know where we're at. You know our needs. I pray you'd search our hearts and convict us and reprove us, exhort us, encourage us. Lord, you know what the need is. I pray you'd accomplish it in us today. For your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I have us to know in this passage is the capitulation, the capitulation. And, and to kind of get us caught up to speed in chapter number 30, I'm just going to kind of recap a little bit of David's life. And we're familiar with David. Most people know about David and Goliath. That came about after David had been anointed already and foretold and prophesied that he would be king after Saul. David then went out. He fought Goliath. He slew the giant. And from that, he became popular in Israel. He was uh, uh, given by Saul a position as the captain of Saul's armies. Uh, David went out and the Lord was with him and he defeated the enemy and, and, and the people sang his praises. Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And because of that, Saul got envious of David. Saul could not stand for anybody to have uh, any sort of uh, uh, recognition on, on an equal plane as he himself, especially not to be uh, ascribed more uh, than Saul. And, and so Saul began to eye David and began to try to kill David. In fact, we saw a few weeks ago how that the Lord uh, had, uh, had actually given Saul into David's hand. Saul was hunting David down, and yet as he was hunting David down, the hunter became the hunted. His life in David's hands, but David spared him, showed him mercy, and Saul went on his way. He declared how righteous David was, how unrighteous Saul was, but Saul still could not let it go. In fact, if we were to turn back just a few chapters into 1 Samuel chapter number, 20, uh, chapter number 26, you will find Saul again hunting for David. Uh, he was told where David was, and so Saul grabbed his army again. He went down to try to kill David and be rid of this one who'd been anointed by God to take his place. But while he was there, the Lord again supernaturally worked and put Saul in David's hands. This time entirely different. He caused a deep sleep to fall on Saul and his entire army. So David and one of his men, Abiathar, walked right into the midst of Saul's camp. And there was Saul asleep and all of the soldiers around them. And right next to Saul was his spear. And David's, uh, David's mighty man, Abiathar, who was beside him, said, Hey, David, just let me have one shot with that spear. Just one I'll just give him one poke. That's all it'll be. Uh, just one time, please. And, uh, you know, I'll be happy. Um, but David said, no, we're not going to touch God's anointed. For the second time, he shows mercy to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 26. He takes Saul's spear. He takes Saul's canteen and he leaves. The next morning, as Saul and all his men are getting up, David comes on the rise, and, and there on the horizon, he lifts up the spear in the canteen, and he calls out to David's captain, Abner, and he says, Abner, your life should be taken from you because someone came into the camp to, to, to take the life of your master, to take the life of the king, and you slept through it. And Saul is like, is this your voice, my son David? And David said, look, I could have taken your life. I have your spear in your canteen. And Saul again confesses, you're more righteous than I. I know that you'll be the king. And he leaves. But notice chapter 27 and verse number 1. After all of this, and David has been a fugitive for years. The Lord has spared David's life now multiple occasions, supernaturally. Whether it's the deep sleep on Saul and his men, whether it's bringing Saul into David's cave, whether it's at just the right time having the Philistines invade so Saul had to turn back, whether it was the time that Saul had, uh, uh, the, the Lord just moved and overpowered Saul so that he just sat down and prophesied and couldn't harm David. Again and again and again, the Lord had shown himself faithful and protected David, and he's done it again. But notice in chapter 27 and verse number 1, it says, and David said in his heart, note that, David's meditation, David talking to himself, and look at what he tells himself, 
I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. Rather than David being confident in the Lord's supernatural protection, David emerges from this later encounter with this latest encounter with Saul fearful. That long, hard road had worn David's faith down. And we see what he's saying to himself. If I stay in Israel, Saul's finally going to get me. One of these times I'm going to die. Now again, we could look back and we could see the Lord had been faithful. The Lord had told him to be in the southernmost parts of Judah. One, there was another occasion where David had left. He got into Moab and he said, hey, let's see what God wants us to do. And, and God told him, get out of Moab and get back to Judah. And that's where David's been for years, even as a fugitive against Saul. And the Lord's protected him again and again and again. But in this latest interaction with Saul, David says, he's finally going to kill me one of these days. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. Did he seek God on this? No. It's a decision that is dictated by fear. It's a decision that was made because he was not speaking truth within his own heart. Was it possible for Saul to take David's life? And the answer is no. The Lord had promised that David would be the next king. He'd been anointed by the prophet Samuel. There is nothing that Saul could do to interfere with the plan of God. What God had promised, God is always faithful to accomplish. David had nothing to fear when he was in the will of God. But he did fear. And as a result of the, what he thought in his heart, David's inner reasoning led him out of where he should have been. And so we find David's mess. David's meditation leads to David's mess. Wrong reasoning leads to wrong decisions and actions. And for the second time, even as we read in verse number one, David runs to the Philistines for refuge. He goes to the enemies of God to find safety. Again, think of that. He tried that once before and he'd had to flee from them. We saw that several weeks ago. Now he goes back one more time. And this is something that is very foolish. This time as he goes to the land of the Philistines in this act of fear rather than this act of, of faith, he goes to Achish and, and Achish now knows David's not been fighting with Saul. Saul's been hunting for David. I think David probably has proof of that. And, and, and Achish now it allows David to come and to stay with them. And Achish is thinking, hey, the enemy of Saul, and, and David is a mighty man, and David is a mighty warrior. Hey, we could have him on our side, and we get David and his men on our side. Now we're stronger, Israel's weaker. And, and so Achish makes a deal with David. In fact, he gives David a city, the city of Ziklag. And he says, you and your men go and dwell there. And that's what David decides to do. While David makes Ziklag his base, David also needed provision. And so we read in the story, if we had the time this morning, of how David would raid villages to the south of Judah, not in Judah, villages of the Amalekites and other peoples that were there. He would raid those villages. He would raise those villages. He would bring back the spoil and the provision for them. And when Achish would ask David, David, where have you been? David would say, well, I've been raiding Judah. Achish thinking, well, if he's raiding Judah now, David really is hated by Israel. He'll be my servant forever. But David was living deceptively. And you know, for a year and a half, the Bible would tell us 16 months, all seemed grand for David. He was doing as he pleased, building his own city, reigning as a little king over that city. No more worries and fear about Saul. You can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, and David was. A year and a half, everything was smooth sailing. But then chapter number 28 of 1 Samuel comes, and we read the plans of the Philistines. And the Philistine plan is to invade Israel again, and this time, once and for all, defeat Saul and be done with him. And by the way, they would be successful in that. 
And so they've sent word out, and the Philistines, which had their own little individual city-states, they all come together with their armies, and, and they're going to have this massive, massive army invade Israel and be done with Saul. They're going to defeat Israel. They're going to reclaim the lands that Israel had taken. They're going to have victory. That's the Philistine thought. And so Achish calls David and says, David, come with us because it's the showdown. Now, I don't know what David's plans were. Again, David had not been invading Judah. In fact, in those spoils that he'd been taken from those raids, he'd been sending some of those things into Judah as gifts. And so you can see David's heart was still with Israel. And David, I believe, as this opportunity is given to go and fight with the Philistines against Israel, boy, what a place to be. I'm going to go and fight against the people of God. That's the invitation to David. That's how far from God you will or out of the will of God he is. I think probably in David's mind, he's thinking, you know, I'm going to get on the battlefield and this is where I'm going to rejoin and Saul can see my loyalty and I'll take my men and we'll fight together against the Philistines. That's, the Bible doesn't say that's what his thinking was, but that's what I believe his thinking was. And so David took all of his men, all 600 men. He left the wives and the children alone at Ziglag I believe because he knows Israel is going to need every last man to beat this massive army. So David has all 600 of his men. They go and they join the Philistines. Now, when the other Philistines see David, they recognize him and they say, wait a second, Achish, the king of Gath, the one Philistine leader that David had been serving. They said, wait a second, Achish, these guys can't go out and fight with us. How can we have Israelis fighting with us against Israelis? They're going to get on the battlefield and they're going to turn against us. And Achish says, no, 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 David, he's faithful. (laughs) David had Achish deceived. He's faithful. He'll he'll be with us. But the other the other Philistine lords, they said no. And so Achish said, look, I know you'd be on our side, but you can't go. So you can just go on back home. And so David and his 600 men trek back to Ziklag. And that's where we find him in 1 Samuel chapter number 30. Heading back to that city that he'd been given by the Philistines, that place outside of the promised land. But you know, when we look at this passage, there's something that we find, and that is the chastening that David received. We have to understand our Father, our Heavenly Father. As a good and loving father, our God corrects and disciplines his children. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, it says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. The word chastening is discipline or or training. It can refer to spankings uh, in, in uh, in that Greek language. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth or whips every son whom he receives. I don't know about you, but growing up, I got my fair share of whippings from my dad. And uh, I needed them. I probably didn't get as many as I needed. When I look back at it, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 and 8 tells us that that chastening that we get from our fathers is because of our relationship. The chastening we receive from God is because of our relationship. When I was growing up, my dad spanked me, I don't know, countless times. But he never spanked the kid down the street. Why? Simple. Simple wasn't his son. If it had been his son, tell, let me tell you, there, there were things that kid down the street needed to, needed to get some lessons about. He would have got spanked. All right, but he didn't. So it says in Hebrews chapter number 12, it says that if you are not chastened of the Lord, you are not a son of God. Every child of God will face the Lord's chastening. You can count on it. You step out of the will of God, And God, in his love, will discipline you. You say, well, why? Well, aren't you a parent? (laughs) Haven't you had a kid? Why do we discipline our children? It's because you love them. It's because you want what's best for them. It's because you want them to turn out right. That's what discipline's all about. These verses in Hebrews teach us something important about a Christian in sin. When a true believer, and again, there are many fakes, 
But when a true believer falls into sin, the Father will chasten him. If there's no chastening, it's because the professing Christian is a fraud. A true Christian cannot live happily ever after in sin. The Word of God says elsewhere, the Spirit of God is grieved within the child of God who lives in sin. The joy of the Lord is lost until correction is made. But I want to say today, praise God, the Lord will not let us live in sin. When we face plant and face, or face down in the water, He doesn't just leave us there. He picks us up. He puts us in the way that we should go. Jacob resisted God until the Lord reached down and touched his hip. And then Jacob clung to God. And so it is that he chastens us for the same reason. The Lord told the churches in Revelation, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God loves us, and so he rebukes and chastens us. And knowing the Father, we see and understand what transpires in David's life in 1 Samuel 30. I believe it's a chastening chapter for a son who's out of the will of God. Not only that, but we also see in this passage the forbearance of God. If you were to look back at 1 Samuel chapter 27, the time that David dwelt at Ziklag was a full year and four months, 16 months. And the Lord could have forced David back to Judah right away. But he let David linger there for a time. The Lord was forbearing. He provided David an opportunity, one that David did not take. It also taught David a vital lesson, and it teaches us one as well. Our Father calls us to forbear one another in love and be forbearing because he is. But after 16 months, the Lord moves. Notice what he does to Ziklag in verse number 1 and 2. Notice what happened. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. Burned with fire. Sixteen months David and his men had lived there. All that they had built... Every home, every building, every stable, every modification, every investment, it was all turned to ash. Now think about this for a moment, because here is a powerful picture for us. David had left Judah where the Lord told him to be. He left living by faith and trusting God's counsel and protection and provision, and he started living instead by sight. By the way that seemed right in his own eyes, by the counsel of his own heart, and out of the will of God, outside the will of God, he had labored, he had built, and things seemed to be progressing. But in one day, it's all gone. Everything he had done out of the place of blessing, out of the promised land, out of God's will, it all burned up. And so will it be in the judgment for every child of God who builds his life outside of the will of God. Everything that we do, everything that we say, it doesn't matter if it's church related, if it is if it's in our family, if it's in our jobs, everything that we do, every moment that we live outside of God's will, when we're doing our own thing, when we're following our own mind and doing our own will, when we're living by sight rather than walking by faith, everything that we do in the judgment that is outside the will of God, it will be burned up. All of it. Everything that we have invested our lives in, it will all be lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse number 10 says, Let every man take how he build it, take heed how he builds. In verse 12, now if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be, man, be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Revelation chapter 1, Jesus is pictured as one whose head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Eyes like fire, trying, judging every man's work. Seven churches he talked to, and all seven churches, he said the same thing. He says, I know thy works. And every church's works were brought under the gaze of, 
of that judge so that he would look at all that they had done. And five out of the seven churches were on the verge of losing everything. Because none of it was being done in the will of God. None of it was being done for the glory of God. None of it was being done for the love of God. One day our works will be tried by fire. I wonder today if there's some of us here that are building our own personal ziklag. We've left behind where God would have us to be. And we're just building up temporal things, temporal pleasures, temporal stations, just living out the American dream with no real thought for eternity or the purposes of God. This world is a ziklag. Everything that we see around us, whether we go tour Washington, D.C., whether we go out to the beach here, all of these things one day will be burned up. It doesn't last. It's not eternal works. The Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Are the things that you're doing going to last? Are you making a difference in eternity? When the Lord puts your life under the microscope, will he be pleased? The Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We, we have to judge our own lives and ask ourselves, what am I doing? What have, I been, what have I been up to just this past week for the kingdom of God? What have I been doing for the glory of God? What have I been motivated by the, to do by the love of God? What, what was it that I did that was worth anything? Remember the great purpose of life. The Apostle Paul summed it up this way. For to me to live is Christ. And the things in my life that I do that are not about Christ. And again, I can do church work and it not be about Christ from within my heart. But the things that I do for Christ, there is a reward. But the things that I do that's not for Christ, it's all a waste. This is why I'm here. Christ is who matters, pleasing him, glorifying him, following him, growing to be like him. This is our purpose. Don't waste your life building in zigzag. As a Christian, we've got to be in the land of promise, the place of blessing, which is the will of God. Seeking his will, doing his will. When's the last time you asked the Lord, hey, what saith my Lord to his servant? What do you want from me today? Lead me today. Let me do what you would have me to do. Let me be what you want me to be. This is how we must live as his faithful servant. I want you to see another thing in this passage. And not just the fire, but notice also his family. The Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag. They smote Ziklag, burned it with fire. They took the women captives that were therein. And praise God, they did not kill them. Rather, the Amalekites, driven by money, I'm sure had plans to sell them. Because slaves could bring quite, quite a reward, a treasure to the Amalekites. But think about it for just a moment. It's David and his men. They've been out with the Philistines. They thought they were going to go to a war. And instead of going to the war, they come back marching to their home at Ziklag. And as they get back into their home, even from a distance, they can see the smoke ascending up. I'm sure that would be worrying. It was just the wife and kids that were left behind. Why is there, why is there so much smoke? You come over the rise, you begin to look, and, and you see the whole place. You know, so much of it has just collapsed, and, and there's just a big heap, and fire is everywhere. Can you imagine these men on their horses galloping in and screaming for their wives and children? I mean, put yourself there, men. What would you do? As they go searching through the whole city, there's nobody. They're all gone. And would you not just fall to your knees in utter grief? And so it was for these men. They began to weep. They began to wail. Crying out their wives' names, their children's names. You know, David had left the place where God had him. He pursued what was right in his own eyes. And for 16 months, he wasted his life. And not only did he waste what he had built... 
but his family was taken captive as a result. Read the story of Lot, and you'll see a man who gave his life for a ziklag, who went out into the world. He followed his own eyes rather than living by faith. He walked by sight, and as he went into Sodom, because, hey, he could make it good in Sodom, and for a time it looked like he had. Lot was, was, was building his fortunes. Lot was progressing up the social ladder. Lot was even sitting in the city gate as one of the city leaders. Maybe he was even mayor. Everything seemed golden. But again, in a day, he lost it all. And he had no children that would follow him out of that city. He lost his whole family because this man who knew the Lord, this man who in the New Testament is called righteous, he gave his life for temporal pleasures, temporal possessions, temporal positions, and he lost his family. Well, this stands as a great warning to us. We see David's on that same trek. We notice then the fear that grips David's heart. The Bible tells us in verse number 6, David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Greatly distressed. You can imagine these men saying, look at what David's done. He led us out here to Ziklag. He left our wives and children defenseless. He's cost us everything. Shouldn't David pay for this? By the way, those men weren't wrong. It was David that was responsible. It was David who had failed in his leadership. And what we learn in all of this is today, don't live your life away from God. Don't live outside of where God wants you to be, walking with God, knowing God, serving God. Don't give your life for the ziklags of this world. Notice finally here today the correction. Notice the correction of David. The Bible tells in verse number 6 what David does in, in this moment because this is what the Lord was bringing about in David's life. We call this, I call this message the rescue. Right now it just looks like a disaster. But the Lord pulls him out. And it starts with this. It says, But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The word encourage means to strengthen. It's used in the encouragement that God gave Joshua in Joshua 1, 9. Be strong and of a good courage. The same word is used right there. David encouraged himself. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. How do we encourage ourselves? How do we encourage, how do we strengthen ourselves in the Lord? What must David have done? I think if we were to encourage ourselves, no doubt David began to speak the truth about God's character. Who God is. That's how we encourage ourselves. The Lord God is faithful. I think at this point, David would be rejoicing God is merciful. <laughs> he knows God is merciful. Not only that, we speak the truth about God's faithfulness. Lord, you've brought me through the valley of the shadow of death again and again. Lord, you can do it again. I believe that you will. You're my shepherd. Lord, help me. We speak the truth not only about God's character and faithfulness, but we speak the truth about God's promises. And David had plenty of those. We speak the truth about God's power. What can't God do? But ultimately, David spoke to himself. Notice, he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So many today depend on others to speak truth to them in the midst of their trial. David didn't have anybody else. In order for David to get out of this mess, David had to speak truth to himself. And we've got to get to that place in our own spiritual maturity where we speak truth to ourselves within our own heart. He had gotten into the mess because he had spoken lies to himself. Now he's able to find himself out of the mess by speaking truth. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Notice what comes next. Not only David's strength, but also David's seeking. Look at what he immediately does in verse number 7. David said to Abiathar the priest, to Himelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord. 
this is where he needed to get back to do it, what he needed to get back to. Lord, what should we do? Lord, can we catch this group that has our wives and kids? Lord, if, if we catch them, can we overcome them? David was told by the Lord, David, go. You'll recover everyone. But we see David seeking again. If only he had sought the Lord's will, if only he had been pursuing that for the last 16 months, none of this would have happened. David's mess because of David's original meditation. But notice where the Lord brings him back to. He brings him back to a place where he's seeking after God. And that is where God wants us to be today. You need to be in a place in your life where you're saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This is how Saul, uh, the Apostle Paul began his ministry. And so it must be for us continually. Lord, what will you have me to do? Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. What saith my Lord to his servant? These are prayers of God's people, and, and so it is for us be there, seeking after God and doing what God wants us to do. And the story, we'll see the conquest. We'll find that the Lord had provided someone along the way to lead them in the way that he should go. You'd find in this story the success, complete success, the Amalekites having a drunken celebration, totally caught off guard by David and his men and able to recover every wife and child and all that was lost and bring it back with them. You know what we learn is God is good. Though David had made such a mess of things, yet the Lord restored his family and the families of all of his men. Look, I don't know how far you've wandered from God in your life, but God is able to restore you. First and foremost, to get you to the place where your life is on track, where you are seeking after God, where you are in the will of God, where you're doing the will of God. It may be 16 months that you've been away from God. It may be 16 years like it was for the people in Haggai chapter 1. Humble yourself. And go to the Lord. I'm so glad today we serve a good and merciful Father. Questions this morning then in conclusion with this message are this. Right now are you doing God's will? Are you in God's will? Are you pursuing your calling in Christ? Are you seeking his counsel? Leaning on his word? Or are you leaning on your own understanding, walking by sight rather than by faith? I wonder, is your life filled up with building things that are just going to burn at the judgment? I wonder, where is your life leading others? Further today, what are you speaking to yourself what are you speaking to yourself about your circumstances? What are you speaking to yourself about God? What are you speaking to yourself about your purpose? What are you speaking to yourself about the world? Speak truth in your own heart. May we, like David, say, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. This morning, if you're away from God, you say, oh, pastor, I know I was saved. I remember the time the Lord came into my life. And he made me his own, but I have not been living for him. I know it. Well, use today as a moment from God to make that right with God. Begin speaking truth in your heart. Begin seeking after God again. Today, don't delay. Don't put it off. Now's the time. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today. I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. I pray, Father, a blessing on your word. Lord, bless it to our lives. Bring about a change in us that you desire to make. Help us, Lord, to live for you. Help us, Lord, to walk with you, abide with you. Lord, may our greatest joy be to know you and to serve you. Lord, show us where we've fallen away. Bring us back, Lord, to where we ought to be. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Not only in salvation, Lord, but also in us as your children. Lord, day by day and year by year, 
Work in our lives today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.